So RV and camping, first of all, uh, when you count usage for RV and camping, it's one. Right? If you come for a day, it's one. If you stay for a week, it's one. If you stay for a month, it's one. Okay? And they don't count how many people are in the RV. Okay? So you really um, don't get a good uh, view of that. But the other thing that's interesting here, this is, that is the trails. Trail usage is driving RV um, usage. This is before the expansion of point. Right, this is before the expansion. And the other thing that they've done is take reservations. So between those two things, that's what's driving RV usage. Nobody drives across the country hoping they're going to get an RV spot. <laughs> you know. So taking reservations is one thing, but if you actually go out and look at the people who are staying in the RV park, many of them have a rack of bikes right next to them. The other thing that I didn't discuss when we were on the bicycle page, that increase in income more than pays the $35,000 that we Right, and that's one of the biggest questions that you know we, I get all the time, especially from the golfers, is how come we're paying for these trails when we don't get any revenue from them, right? And the answer is we're getting revenue in RV that pays for the maintenance. And that pretty much ends that conversation. Okay. Um, this chart I'm sure you're all familiar with, this is the, the golf rounds. Okay. Uh, it's been on a steady decrease. This was uh, an exceptionally good weather year. You know, just like everything else, weather drives golf. Okay. This was a good weather year and no floods. Okay. If you take this back another 10 years, it's exactly the same slope. It's been on this slope for 20 years. So we're losing golf rounds. Okay. This particular one here, uh, again, two different scales, the big scale and the little scale. So the yellow line is all of recreation usage. The green line is golf. And the blue line here, which is on a different scale, is lakes. Okay. And I, I made it lakes because if it's at the bottom, you don't see the trend. But you'll see there's this nice steady trend, and that's the kayaks, the non-motorized boats. Susan, when did we start requiring the registration of kayak? Um, it was really, I think, 215 that the POA got in, into it in a big way. Is that about right? They, they, they've always been on the price list. They started enforcing it uh, two or three years ago. I mean, they're still not 100% enforcement today. You drive, you drive, you go down the lake, and you'll see. I think you'll see houses in that later and kayaks lined up. And the, the, the thing that's, I think, also been interesting here is this, this is also indicative in a lot of ways of who lives on the lake today versus who lived on the lake 15 years ago. Because as the houses have sold, you know, after the recession came, the houses have all been selling, many, many more families live on the lake than they did before. I mean, when we, we moved in 10 years ago, and it would be us and a couple other people and our pontoon boats and some fishing guides, right? And that's it. And now you have to be really careful when you're driving because those little things that look like ducks are people swimming in the lakes and kids. We have a neighbor that has six kids and they all have a kayak. Little ones, big ones. So, uh, so, and so that, that's just something that's happening in the lakes. It's really um, interesting. And the other thing to remember on uh, boats to register a motorized boat is two hundred and fifty dollars or so. Okay, so it's a big ticket item. Okay, so the next one is general observations. So um, in general, as we tap new markets, our usage is, usage improves, and usage is important. Tom will talk about that a little bit more. It's not just about revenue. It's our goal is really to get people out and playing. Um, so. Um, New markets, and then we also see usage increase when we keep our offerings current. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the classes or earlier, most of the classes were aimed at retired people, right? Now you have power classes. You have power fitness, power water, power everything. Um, like Avalon Beach is a good example. We improved the fitness equipment in 
all of our uh, fitness facilities, and of course our urban reservations. Okay, golf. You guys know mostly about golf. Uh, most of the statistics. Uh, uh, 5,500 people played golf in 2017. About a third of those played one round or less. And another third played less than 30 or so. 18% uh, mem of members who played golf. So 18% of members playing golf played 72% of the rounds. So what's happening is there are a lot of rounds being played by a few people. Okay, if you're golfers, you go, that's great, wonderful, we're playing, it doesn't cost us any more to play more rounds. When you're a non-golfer, what you're saying, seeing is that we're spending as much on 160 golfers as we are on the entire recreation department. Okay, so if you start seeing that there's a disproportionate share of money that's being spent on certain people. Uh, and guests, we talk a lot about guests and whether guests should play or not play. Um, guests play 33,000 rounds, that's enough for one golf course. So, you know, for the people who say, oh, we don't want the guests, that, then, then great. Or, which one do we close? So isn't that much that the average guest pay when you play? I think it's about $40. $40, green fee. Pro shop I don't know. I don't know. I, what, what, I, what I got was a list of, um, no, on that one I simply got, I just have guest rounds, which I backed into, right? Because I know how many member rounds they were and how many total rounds, so I just backed into guest rounds. Okay. So I think guests are very <laughs> profitable. I think just, just the more is better. Yeah. Guest rounds include so the playing tournaments, correct? Uh, yes and no. Answer challenge. Or, you know, basically everybody is a oh, guest at the cancer challenge, right? Yeah. So even the members who play at the cancer challenge count as a guest for that, okay? But most of the POA tournaments, either the ones that the POA does or things like the animal shelter and the Bella Vista band and that where you come in and check in, you show your ID, you know, they check you right. in under your member number, those go into member rounds. Okay. Okay. And they did a an evaluation a little while back about how close that is, you know, how many are lost, and it was about 2% of the rounds. So I worked in POS for a long time. If I had a 2% accuracy rate at Walmart, I would be thrilled, okay? So it's within uh, industry tolerances of how close that is. And, and, the, and the golf report does have a number uh, for a blended rate for what guests play. I don't have that with me right now, but it was in the, the high 30s. Because okay. a lot of a lot of guests play in the afternoon, right? Which are, okay. right now is $25. Okay. So okay. it's not the it's not the full published price. Right? And all that all that all the statistics That's are in the golf report. Okay. Look I can look that up. Okay. I got that. Okay. So this is uh, a summary of things of going up and down and. The green arrows mean it's good for the POA, the red arrows mean it's bad. And depending on if it's a cost or a revenue, this is usage, but that's what it is. So uh, fitness is up, uh, clubs and facility rental is even, outdoor pools is even, generally, but I had to put a little up arrow anticipating the Lake Avalon Beach, which is gonna be next year, and we know that's gonna drive pool usage way up. Okay, tennis is down, are we camping way up, 40% up over the last two years. Uh, the gun range, again, had been trending down, but with the uh, introduction that started late last year and certainly this year about uh, the gun classes, beginner classes, concealed weapons classes, and so on, that's also turned around. And those are big ticket items. I mean, we don't give away those gun classes anymore. Okay? They're like 120 bucks or something, some of them. More than that, I mean, it's, a, it's Okay, but it, it's a it's a big ticket item for us. So in the, in the gun range business, that, you know that makes a big difference. Uh, boat registration is up, non motorized boats, and then golf is down. Susan, on that you showed in 1999 that you entered the six or five thousand rounds mm -hmm. a year. Why do we keep using that number when we 
pretty much agreed that's impossible. I don't know that it's impossible, and we've got statistics. And we've got a cheap from the time. It's we a thousand have. rounds a day. We have, okay. We, for six golf We have a, a sheet days. that was published at the time like, that had that. And we talked to Jason Lloyd, who actually lived here back then, and he said it was absolutely that's what it was like. Every day, all day, the courses were packed, and there was never anything less than a five hour round. So. I, I, don't, I don't believe it either. It just, it's almost impossible. When it seems how impossible. Many, how many, because that's tea times from 8 o'clock to 4, and you can't even get through that. And that's every tea time full for 250 days a year. Three, or now, I know we can play 300 days a year. I think part of that is, and it may have been very busy, but I think part of that is the way it was counted back then. They, didn't, they may have counted nine whole rounds, and they may not count 18. In 1998, the population of Bella Vista was half what it is right now. It was 15,000. population of Northwest Arkansas was less than half what it is now. So I think it's an accounting thing. Great. I'm not arguing with the fact that the golf is going down. We all know that, and we've got too many golf courses. But uh, you know, yeah. 65, I mean, if somebody was doing some creative accounting, whether that was Mike Shea or Tom uh, Bay or whoever the hell was here. Well, the and, and, and he was, or 18 of us counted as two. Yeah. I don't know. All, all we know is we have a sheet from back in the time that that's what it said. Okay. So what I, yeah, I guess the point of it is that it's right. not, this is not a current not trend. Really. This trend was, I remember the first annual meeting I went to was 2010 and they showed a chart and it looked just like that. And actually we have a newspaper article from that, from 2008 that says we've been losing rounds for, you know, 10 years. Same deal. So, okay, anyway, let's move on. One, one comment. I'm going to comment on what you're saying here. It may be impossible. The figures may be wrong. But they are the ones that are published. If you don't use the published figures, then that throws suspect on all of the uh, summaries and all of the accounting messages. So you have to use the number that was published, even though it may be wrong. Some of the other ones may be wrong too. Well, I agree. Yeah. I don't have a problem with that. And like I said, we all know down the trend that's evident, regardless of what that number right. was. And, in, the, and the, the real point is, we are where we are, right? Okay, the next, so that was all about usage and just how many people are using things. So uh, three main things we're talking about is cost, revenue, and then assessment contribution. Okay, so um, assessment contribution is the difference between the revenue and the cost. Okay, and if you go back to the financials um, uh, a while back, um, the, the assessment contribution was a budgeted number, okay? What we're using here is the math, just the straight math that's the difference, okay? So we can compare current versus what was done in the past, okay? Uh, and uh, what we are, go back a little bit, what we are talking about is, uh, I called it for general infrastructure, it's more than that, but it, 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 the capital projects, anything that's in F&A and anything that's in math. Okay, so, um, which is a, a substantial part of our budget, it's about half of our budget overall, I think those three. And it also doesn't include food and beverage, because food and beverage was um, brand new last year, so there's no point in trying to do any kind of this sort of analysis. Okay, so this is recreation. So on these charts, um, unlike what I used to be, the uh, lake costs fluctuate uh, here, depending, this, these are both lake drawdown years when they draw down the lake and they do a lot of work. Okay, so that tended to drive their costs up some. Um, we had some a lake drawdown here too. Um, so, but the cost then kind of came down and around. But it, but overall, it's actually pretty, pretty flat. In fact, one of the things that was remarkable about all these lines is how flat they are. All right, that was the kind of interesting point about how boring it was. Uh, but also you see here, this is revenue now. Revenue's going up, it was up. And therefore their assessment contribution was down. And that was, that's $40,000 right there. Okay. Uh, the ad an average price per boat. Um, in 2010, the price was $119 a boat. 
and no, 135, and in 2017 it's 119. And so what you're seeing is the difference in uh, the, the amount of the non-motorized, which are $25, so that will drive your average down. $20, sorry, $20. Okay, this is golf. Um, again, okay, so the remarkable things to me is that even though our rounds are down, our revenue has been fairly steady. Okay, this is when we did the price increase to cover the tax, I think it was about a 15% increase. Um, but, you know, it's pretty steady. And so that was really good news considering how, much, how many rounds were down. The challenge here is the uh, costs are, and these are well within historical averages, right? I mean, this is not unusual, but that little line between here and here on golf is $200,000. So golf is just so much bigger than everything else that a, a small hiccup in either cost going up, revenue going down, makes a big difference. Okay, the uh, assessment contribution uh, has gone up actually 37% since 2010. So, uh, and again, in, in golf, anytime we talk about uh, especially things per round, the loss in rounds is the big thing that's changing. It's not necessarily the revenue or the cost. Is the pro shop factored into these? Yes, this is total revenue. I mean, it's, yeah, in the total picture, it's a line item, but it's not huge. And it's been steady for a long, long time. Yeah, just recently, and again, it's it's not a huge number. Okay, so this is the next one is kind of interesting and was surprising to me, uh, mostly because the the conventional wisdom is that golf pays for everything else, right? We're paying everybody to play tennis. We're playing, and what you see is the the revenue is the green as a percentage, as a hundred percent, and the assessment contribution is here. So golf gets a contribution of 34% of the total. Recreation is 40% and lakes is 37%. Okay, so all of this, all of the different department and divisions are, everything is, except for RVs, is actually has a subsidy, but it's not the dramatic difference that it was a, a number of years ago. When in fact we didn't really drive much revenue out of lakes or rec. Okay, so this is uh, dollars, okay? Where the other one was percent, this is dollars. So you can see here that golf is the, is the big number, right? Um, the assessment in golf is 2.2 million. The yellow is 2.2 million. In recreation, this is 611,000. And in lakes, it's 320. So, um, Golf is just big, right? So it's the sheer dollars in golf that are the important thing, right? That, uh, I mean, if you think about it, you know, we recently replaced the green at, at Scottsdale for $50,000, and it just, and if you just are used to that kind of number in golf, right? Yet when we talk about $35,000 for the trails, it seems like a lot of money, okay? So, uh, I think that was, okay, so our uh, general trends, um, so in recreation, uh, revenue surpassing cost increase, uh, that is not correct. And I will change that, because like, it's 320, uh, not 625, 320 less. So I apologize for that. Um, and we'll send out a few copies. Um, so 320 there. Um, wait a second, let me double check. I might be wrong.
budget went down 320,000 in 2017. Okay. For lakes, the assessment contribution went down 75? Um, yep, in, 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 from 2005, it's down. 75,000, okay? And less assessment contribution means more money to spend on other things. So less assessment contribution is a good thing. Um, revenue was flat, cost increases, staff, flood repairs and course repairs and improvements under uh, 10,000. And then assessment contribution has increased about 200,000 per year the last two years. Okay, so it's a penny and we can pretty much put it back because of the flood damage. Uh, no. Uh, I mean, it's a combination of things. We've done, I mean, over the last number of years, we've put in, done a lot of improvements in the quality of our courses. Our courses are not what they were five years ago. Okay, so there's a lot of small things they're doing. Um, certainly floods uh, have impacted us in both of these years because, um, well, it was 2016, yeah, 2016, because that flood came in December, right? Or in the Christmas, right around Christmas. So we had immediate flood damage, and then that also carried into 2017. Yeah, and a lot of and a lot of payroll that goes into cleaning out those floods. Um, and then you got the loss of revenue because the golf course is closed for the, 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 the There's one year with no flood damage. 2012. Yeah. Every other year has flood damage. Yeah, so some of it's baked in. Uh, in and uh, I'm sure Keith would correct me, but the um, the thing about golf that um, payroll's under pretty extreme pressure in the maintenance department because as um, buildings started up, the building trends started up. The same guys who would come and work at our golf courses can make more money doing construction. Right? And, and those are not unskilled jobs. You, I mean, those are skilled jobs. And so finding people at the price we're willing to pay has been a real challenge. And so, um, it, so um, payroll's under pressure, price of gas is under pressure, all petroleum products, which are a lot of our, uh, the chemicals we use are under pressure. So there's a lot of pressure on the cost of maintaining the courses. And then we've also had there, you know, a whole bunch of little stuff goes wrong all the time. Golf courses are living, breathing things. Okay. So the financial trend, um, again, the green is up. This is the wrong number, so I'll fix that. Uh, lakes revenue is way up. Um, their uh, contribution is steady, so their costs are, or their revenue is keeping up with their costs. So their contribution is steady. Uh, golf costs, um, I gave them a little, a little left. You know, it's, it's easy to miss it um, because it's within the averages, right? But it is creeping up. Um, and then the golf contribution has been going up quite a bit. And, uh, you know, Okay. Okay, big picture. You're gonna talk big picture, right, John? I'm gonna talk big picture. Okay. So uh I guess I should get to the next slide. One of the first things that uh, one of the things I get asked often and, and, and lately recently from the people that are really opposed to things like this is when did it become the POA's job to provide services to all these other groups of people? You know, that's this 50% of the population that has a family. Usually referred to as them. Them, yes, them. Uh, if you look at it, in 1965, the opening documents say that the assessment is purpose is to provide recreational amenities for the entire community. It doesn't put, break out any group. It is the job of the POA to provide services for everybody. And that's something that a lot of people forget real quick. Uh, 
we, we need to encourage an active, active uh, lifestyle for the people that live in town, the entire community. It is a nonprofit business. Every amenity will always be subsidized. Okay? The idea that anything's going to pay for itself, you know, wipe it out of your brain. It's not, it's not in the DNA of the POI. Um, but one of the things we need to make sure that we think about in all of this is what about all the things that we do that aren't, aren't trackable, that we can't collect money for? Those are still services that a large percentage of the people that live here use. And we need to make sure that we provide those uh, to those, that group of people. And that's the simple little things like walking around the trail. But one of the things you'll find out from the city here in a, in a couple of weeks, they have a trail camera on the Lake Bell Vista Trail. 155,000 people went around that trail last year. The, two years ago, the city of Bella Vista did a survey, or the city of Bentonville did a survey of people walking and riding around that trail. 74% 70, of them live in Bella Vista, not Bentonville. Okay. That means that 100,000, 120,000 people that live here went to the neighboring town to walk on a flat road surface trail. Might just say that we're a little short in flat surface trails in Bella Vista. When 100,000 100, people leave town to do something. Okay. Um, yeah, with the Plank Bell Vista visually in Bella Vista. But it's not in Bella Vista. But it's not in Bella Vista. Well, I know that, this group is not providing that service to right. its members. Okay. We gave that service away. Yeah, that, well, yeah. Well, whatever, whatever story you want to be doing, yeah. it, it's not here. Okay. Uh, so, Having said all that, there's a different number that tracks usage. And on your sheets that you have, uh, and it, we, uh, we named it in a brand new term called realistic usage. And this is when you take all the things that aren't counted and figure it into usage. And this is what it looks like. So you want me to talk about that part? Uh, that's okay. It's not that. It's yeah. not that complicated. These yeah. guys will figure it out. It, it's and it's all. It's the when you look at the sheet, the <laughs> assumptions we made are in there. We tried to keep them very conservative. Okay, like uh, on the number of people who walk and go to the dog park, I said, man, eh, times two, right? Uh, from recreation, RV campers, the number of RVs times two, right? To count the people in. Uh, playgrounds and pavilions, I thought, oh, the number of people who use the fitness centers, 25% of that, right? Just trying to come up with some reasonable numbers for, to look at things. Um, you know, on boats, again, all we get is a one-time boat registration. So we figured there were 18 weeks in the season, you go out once a week and there are two people in your boat. Okay, so that's the kind of... They're pretty conservative numbers. Yeah, and then it counts fishermen. Yeah, I think the driving range, we, we assumed that there were 32,000 people that went by the three driving ranges. You know, pr pretty conservative number of people that did that. that. Uh, we only considered that, we, we figured there were 240 people that took at a golf class. Again, a very conservative number. So the numbers tend to be on the conservative side. So when you look at that, First thing it does is it tells you that things aren't quite what everybody thinks they are. There are a lot of people here, there are a lot of people here, and there are a lot, there's still a lot of people here. But these other groups have a lot of years. So the next thing to do is, is one of the big things that everybody's concerned about is how much are we spending as a, an association to do that. That's that same chart, as assessment contribution per use, and it's divided by the realistic uh, number of users. This number used to be the highest number. Like $69. Because it was 60, right? yeah. it was one boat per use, okay. right? So it would be 69 bucks. But when you, when you just figure it with two people a boat, it drops to $1.60. Recreational users are $1.13 a use. Okay, so you see somebody playing at the playground, the POA contributed a dollar and thirteen cents to that kid out there swinging on swings. He didn't pay anything. 
okay? Uh, that drops the uh, per use on the uh, uh, because we have the other people, and it drops the, the dock use it was down to twelve dollars and three cents from fourteen and a half. So that's there for you. So you, that we need to think about the usage, not just the dollars, because it's important that we get all the different groups taken care of. So business considerations. And, and part of the reason we're doing this now is, you know, the budget's coming up. <clears throat> and when we budget, we need to start thinking about where do we want to be in five years? How are we going to be different five years from now than we are today? Uh, are we open to new ideas and are we listening? And I'll, one that I'll tell you that, that I assume is on, uh, on the budget request for lakes is kayak uh, ducks. Just think where our kayak use might be. It had we two years ago or three years ago when kayak started putting kayak dots to encourage people to use our lakes. Because kayaks are difficult for older people to get into. They're very easy to get into with a kayak. Now, I don't know if you guys know what they are. Basically, it's a little ramp. You throw your kayak in, it's kind of sitting there in the water. So you can stand on each side on a nice solid surface, get your larger posterior in there pull yourself off and go out and play, come back and get out without having to get wet. Getting wet when you're 20 years old, no big deal. not a big deal. Getting, getting wet when you're 70, years old, no big deal. when you're 70, it's a different question. Okay? So we need to think and make sure we take care of those concepts. We need to be, uh, listen to new ideas. Uh, the archery guy, just so you know, calls me once a week to find out how to deal with you guys. <laughs> Uh, we don't need, we shouldn't wait for matures to trend to, to mature before we dip our toe in. We should get in there. Uh, uh, clamping cabins, we're getting there. Good, good decision. Okay. But not on the, not necessarily on the bleeding edge. I mean, it's not like we want to be the first in because we're generally a fairly conservative organization, right? And we don't have tons of extra cash sitting around. But as a trend starts, it, it goes. And then it goes like this. We want to be on the beginning of that curve. Uh, the same, and it's the same as microwaves. It used to be, you know, four hundred ninety-nine dollars, and now they're four dollars and ninety-nine cents, right? I mean, because you want to be on the upside of that curve, because that's when things, if, if it's a revenue generator, or uh, really make a difference in uh, how something advances. So, uh, when we take a look at the budget this year, it should, we're encouraging the membership to talk about. A new look, you know, and, and these are different terms: it's bottoms up, top down, greenfield. Uh, wh whatever way you want to talk about looking at the budget as a tool to tell you where you want to go. You know, it's not always good to invest in where you are. It's often it's better to invest in where you want to be, and that's an important concept. Uh, so, so many years budgeting here has been a two percent of last next year. You know, it's it's a print advantage of last year, and that's what. We're I do want to, though, make a comment there, and that is, I've spent a lot of time looking at the budgets and all that, kind of thing. and I'll tell you, from a business standpoint, our budgets are under control, right? Our managers know what they're spending money on. They don't do, I mean, last year plus 2%, and I'll figure out what I need to spend it on, right? I mean, they know, and when you talk to, even like, uh, for me, talking to the golf course superintendents, they know where their where their position is every day. They know, do, am I on track for payroll? Am I on track for what I'm spending? And all of the departments are like that. So our problem is not that we have a financial system that's out of control, okay? But it's just that we need to be thinking about how do we look at stuff for where we want to be. And uh, I'm not going to to uh, spend a lot of time on conclusion, but the basic conclusion is Bella Vista's changed, and we as an the POA as an organization needs to be looking at what the future of Bella Vista is. We are no longer a golfing retirement community. Uh, we're a recreational community for all members that includes golf, fitness, lakes. Uh, we need to talk about how we allocate uh, resources fairly. Uh, Recreation is growing, and we need to look at the markets and make sure that we don't get left behind them. 
with that, I think we're going to end it. There's three more pages for those of you who would like to look through them. Uh, we talk about some other little things there, but uh, here we go. Thank you for your diligence and effort. And I, I will, I'm going to correct my that one mistake. This is an important mistake. And resend out the, uh, the pop. Thank you, Sister Jen. Thanks. Hey, and uh, we're going to stay for the meeting. And if you have questions afterwards, we'll be happy to answer. Okay, we'll move into the five year financial plan. Next on your agenda on page one, you will see the recommendations uh, from uh, to the board from the five year financial planning task force. Uh, so that uh, recommendation uh, is on page one, all the way through page six, and then you'll see uh, the uh, draft of uh, draft of vote on recommendations uh, from the five-year financial planning task force. Uh, where, uh, if you go to page eight, you'll, uh, you'll see the. Uh, Suggested motions. Are there any questions regarding any of those suggested motions? You know, after seeing the growth of the RV park.
fast, you know, and you have the, all the events that we have uh, that go on there, the fleet in the park and so forth. We're starting to max out that area. We're not maxed yet, but we're definitely getting a lot closer than we are at other uh, amenities that we have. Um, yeah, back to Pat's kind of suggestion, Arkmo. I think it's uh, it's valid to at least test the developer for exception to it because we're not we're not adding real estate. We're adding camping, and it's a POA function. It's not other people who have property who have owned buy lots or build on those lots. Perhaps they would give us an exception to that uh, restriction because it's a terrific location at the south end and we will actually have a piece of the central trail uh, hit the very south end of our and, and, and it's accessible with uh, Gordon Hollow Road. I mean, it's worth trying. I, I have no problem with that. I, I have a comment on the bottom of page six if you check that. The Delta Keeping Brooksdale North open. Uh, that was added in for the years 19, 2019, or 2019 and 2020. Uh, those two, and it's assuming that at that time, uh, the repurposing of Brooksdale North would take place is why that's taken off. And so that that's the reason that it stops there instead of going on the next few years. So I assume it's going to be a year and a half or so before it's repurposed. Is any consideration ever been given to using Brooksdale for a We actually have a uh, preliminary sketch of some uh, holes on Worksdale South, some kayaking and some camping areas right along Little Sugar Creek. It's nothing that we've adopted. It was just one conceptual sketch by a, uh, a landscape. Probably tent camping versus yeah. motor camping. Okay, are there any other questions? Most of you have seen this several times. So. We'll bring that forward uh, at next week's meeting. Uh, on page 10, uh, you'll see the, the capital request uh, from Keith uh, <coughs> regarding uh, purchasing the new uh, greens, the tarps for the greens at Scottsdale. Uh, the total cost of this would be $17,000. Uh, while we have not, we have not received three bids we have done enough research to know that we are getting at a great price. Uh, we're getting it at uh, 10 cents per square foot uh, as opposed to 18 percent, 18 cents per square foot. So we are asking for a waiver because we didn't go out and get a formal bid. We knew that we could not get uh, this product at, at any better price. It's a really good price. Uh, but uh, this is uh, the thickest that we can get. And we'll keep the old tarps also. So when the forecast indicates that the weather is extremely cold, or they're, they're saying that it's going to be extremely cold, we would actually use both sets of tarps, which would uh, help our greens. If you recall, uh, we did not replace all the greens. We only replaced, uh, David, uh, 13 out of 18? Yes, that's correct. 13 out of 18. And the ones that we didn't replace um, were mainly because they were protected because they were haulers and so forth. That's correct. That makes sense. The reason that we're going to we're recommending going occasionally with, with two sets of covers is until the greens get mature. We still know that the ones that Britain survived with the standard covers, and they're six years old. So we didn't have any problems. But for the first couple of years, we we're really going to keep an eye on them and make sure they get as much. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassing myself, but I, I thought that the, the uh, top limit for capital, or the bottom limit for capital projects was 25000 It's 10000 Oh, okay. It's $25,000 to get three bids. And so technically we didn't have to get three bids, but we wanted to at least inform the board and the community that we didn't get three bids in this case. Um, That's the policy requirement. Now, we actually get three bids way below $25,000, but that's what the current policy indicates. Um, 
Well, what is the latitude for your expense? Your your uh, expenditure at your own discretion. Uh, are you talking about operating budget or capital? Capital. Capital without additional permission is ten percent. Uh, or if the uh, if there's a ten percent of what? Ten percent of the total budget uh, is the latitude. Or um, I would meaning if it's we're going to spend more than ten percent. Or if the scope is going to dramatically shift, then I have to go back to the board. I was just one. I, I was just thinking that something like this, I, I would almost think that uh, it could be a discretionary you know, expense on your part because we wouldn't expect you to be, you know, the board to have to, you know, consider whether whether we need tarps. I think that's a that's a no-brainer. You know, we know that we know that the the tarps that we have didn't work. And so the only thing, the only option you have is, is to do something else. And so I, I would just trust your description. Well, it, but I'll, I, I would go along with it. it I mean, it's, we're following policy. Yeah. And the policy doesn't have any latitude with regards to no-breakers. OK. And sometimes the definition <laughs> of a no-breaker is it's not so easy. easy. <laughs> Uh, next up on uh, page 11, you will see uh, the survey results. We were going to have uh, Natalie present these. Unfortunately, she had to go home sick today. Uh, Natalie is one of our newest employees. She's a, a recent graduate of U of A, and she put together the uh, survey monkey for us. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to read it for you. You guys uh, are all capable of doing that. Uh, but you'll see that uh, we received uh, almost 2,600 responses, um, and the uh, majority of them are property owners. Uh, we just wanted to confirm. Uh, that's why that first question is, are you a property owner? We just wanted to make sure. And if they answered no, uh, that was the last question they, they received. Um, we, um, we asked them how many people live in their household. Um, I think questions four and five, which are on page 12, are, are real important within the 12, last 12 months. Um, have you brought friends or family to the uh, POA recreational amenities? And uh, almost 51% said yes. Uh, if, uh, would, you, would you support the POA building and new community center? 62% uh, said yes, but I do need to point out that um, 700 people elected to not answer the question, which I don't know what to make of that, whether you cut that in half or they just were unsure. Uh, and possibly the question should have been yes, no, or undecided. Because I think the 700 would be fall under the undecided category. One of the things that I find as a, a major revenue potential is our continued marketing of property for sale here in our new home permits are showing that we're having quite a bit of interest in living and building and all of this stuff. And when I look at number four and how many people have brought a friend or family member here and 50% of the populations that they had, and I look at 100,000 people on the trails and all are coming from a zip code that's nearby, I have yet to see a very robust program of marketing the potential to live here. It seems like well, it's just given that we're talking to people who already live here, but we're looking at guest rounds being a third, we're looking at 100,000 people on the trails, we're looking at 50% saying that we're bringing a guest here. Where do we invest in signage? to prompt people to make the investment here, whether it's in a membership lot or considering a home here. I don't think we leave this to the realtors to do this job for us. I would hope to see in 2019 as we make budgets that there is a more proactive selling of the real estate here considering as much guest population and usership that we have that are current citizens. We do attend expos in Kansas City, Oklahoma, and uh, Chicago, St. Louis, someplace else. But maybe we need to step that up. Just here locally. No, I think it's a point. Well, 
And, you know, we do some at the trailhead. We have those cards and so forth. This is David Thornton, our primary salesperson for the Alonis gets out. Um, but uh, it, it's a valid point. The uh, six, seven hundred lots we have we don't sign on them, do we, for sale by POA? Yeah. Okay. We, we do aggressively market them on our website, yeah. uh, and we send out uh, e-blasts, and those generate a lot of activity. When we do the judicial sales, uh, the one earlier this year, we sold 20 lots, 20, 21 lots, the judicial yeah. sale. Yeah, 20 out of 25. And also, I think this isn't a marketing issue, but uh, Doug and his team are doing a great job on uh, making sure that the lots that they're foreclosing on have uh, potential to sell, as opposed to just randomly just foreclosing on who owns this the most. Uh, because we have a, a very large inventory of lots that we'll probably have for many years to come because they're just unbuildable in some way, shape, or form. Getting back to the community center survey, obviously, you know, it says that most of the people are property owners, but in just reading all of the results, my sense is that the people who answered this survey were younger. And that tells me our younger population is very interested in a new amenity. So I think we need to make sure we keep that in mind as we you know, consider an assessment entries. And I, get one. I think that's, uh, you, you're, you're echoing what John just said about 20 minutes ago about staying relevant. I don't think that's the words you use, but about but that. that close. Yeah, I mean, just in what they wanted and the comments and that, I just, I think it was the younger population that did the survey. So that tells me, you know, anytime you can get the younger people to comment or be involved, you've done something. Because too many of them that I talk to, so, Eh, whatever, you know, you're going to do your thing, you know, why not? It's hard to get them motivated to actually vote. See, I read this and I thought it was mostly older people who answered it. Really? Yeah. I mean, if I look at the, the amenities that they were looking for, and it's the kind of stuff my generation is looking for. That used to be, I mean, biking used to be young. Go out the trails today, and you see this all the time. Like it's well over 50 percent, probably closer to 75 percent, are in the senior range. Yeah. We get your issue. Do you have a green button on? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, so you just need to speak up a little bit more. <laughs> I'm torn on both of those results as well because at a certain Course for me, it says it's, it's digital, so usually that's going to trend towards a younger generation who's more savvy with doing it. But we went to both of the unveilments, and I was easily the youngest person there, and the only one like me. So they would lead me to think that it was Mary's comment to help more weight um, for the amenities that are wanted. And where I see it blending between the two is they feel like even if it was the older gen that filled out the survey they're speaking to what either staying cutting edge or for me their grandkids and the people that they know that are in their neighborhood that they're already speaking for for yeah. others which is more for themselves go ahead Jerry. i want to tag on to what mike was saying about uh, being a little bit more aggressive on uh, introducing the, the people to our, our lots and our sales and so on. Um, you know, signage may help. A lot of people don't read signages. Um, but they uh, 
very good graphic uh, leaflet that is given to each of the campers, especially the tent campers, but most of them were saying are camping. Um, they could be given when they're paying their fees, that kind of thing. Uh, and they could even be talked to very frequently about, you know, hey, you want to live here? Here's how you can do that. Um, then also when there is a major event on the trail, uh, setting up a little covered booth with a an ambassador or somebody there and start talking to them about Bella Vista and what they have to offer for the amenities. Couldn't you put a pamphlet like that on trails too? And boxes like real estate agents use? Um. We looked at we looked at that and we talked to some bikers. Would you be more more apt to take a, a pamphlet? Or we, so we like to do a, a car like a business card, or something they could put in their pocket and take that. And so we we've seen some people pick those up, but not a whole, a whole lot. It has a QR code, right? Yeah, it has a QR code that they can scan with the phone as well. If they have the phone with them, they can scan. And I contribute that more to or graphic design. Like even when we had the Enduro race here and there was hundreds of people at Blowing Springs, we had the POA tent. Nobody knows what the POA is, okay? They're not putting together the acronym and coming up and being like, oh, I'm interested in property. You know, like, no, they're not. You know, it's like, you want to live in Bella Vista? Think about your new summer home. You know, like these are the type of things that you know, are gonna resonate. I'm you know, disappointed by some of the marketing techniques. I think we can always be better no matter where we're at. But I also feel like it's, it's a copyright issue. You know, it's like we don't write very good copy here. You know, like we can be more aggressive with the copy that isn't a, a vanilla. You have to know your market. So if we're on the trail, it needs to be different than what we're putting on the website. If we're on the lake, it needs to be different than what we're putting on the trail. Uh, like that we have to differentiate the market to place our materials correctly. And I agree with Jerry, like we have a very, very easy access to a potential sale at Lion Springs that we're not capitalizing on. Or come up with a sign that has a QR code on it that just says like one likes it, interested in property and all of this to scan this code. And put it at trailheads and put it at like, boat landings and at the camping area and any place else that people like, on a uh, hard surface trail, any place else that people who don't necessarily live here use the facilities. That would be relatively cheap. Well, just to apply what we've done in the past few years in that realm, uh, the best example is next door. The Welcome Center is working. It's attracting uh, people who come to eat here, and it's attracting people who don't know what the thing about Bella Vista, and they see it on the screen and they talk to our people. And I think that's a good, that's been a good kickstart. There's nowhere, nowhere is there a sign that says the Welcome Center is at the Country Club. But if you, if you didn't point. come here to eat, then and nowhere is there a sign that says there's a restaurant that's pretty darn good. I had the opportunity yesterday to meet a couple from Texas who are looking at property up here, uh, and they were very impressed with the Welcome Center. They they got a lot of information they didn't know, and they simply said they looked around for major buildings and uh, to assume that there would be something in here, and they came in here to look. So they were very impressed with the Welcome Center and the different stations of what information they could find. So and they were contacting the Welcome Center itself is very right. impressive. It's just we don't to get tell anybody that it's here. To get them here, so, yeah. You know, this came up uh, in, uh, I, I was uh, down at the recycling center, talked to the guy that managed the stairs, and he asked me if you, could, you, heard, you know that sign on Pena Drive that says, guest center, or what does it say? Yeah, guest check-in. Check guest check-in, okay. People see that sign and drive into the recycling center. Okay, um, but and that's there's there's no other direction to a a uh, a center. Okay, 
uh, if we if if it be possible in terms of signage, if we could put something at the at the base of the uh, at the base of the uh, exit at Lancashire, pointing uh, towards the pointing towards the left, and then once you get to the to Cooper, we've got a sign that you know goes up. Uh, I know that's an additional cost, but at least people going north on the highway. You know, that's the first real thing that looks like an exit off 71. You know, really. So that may be something that we can look at. Some massive honey hole for sales. Everyone is down there with their kids by the scores. I mean, let's let's make proactive move on the soccer field. Anything else? As for open farm, uh, I have an addition to the uh, <coughs> agenda. Uh, this is uh, literally hot off the press. So this is uh, the uh, memo dated August 18th, selection of uh, architect for the country club. Uh, call the board, uh, create a committee made up of Jim, Keith, myself, and David. David is a not, was a non-voting advisor. Uh, it was our goal to uh, seek out uh, potential architects for developing master plan. Uh, we put together an RFP, and you'll see I, I included a, an excerpt for on that RFP, which talks about the goals. Uh, we interviewed six candidates initially. Not all of them were on site on the initial interviews, and we narrowed that down to the top three, which was Collier, Staples, and George Golf. Uh, all of them came out uh, for an interview and toured the property. Uh, and we uh, felt as a group that uh, George Golf was the most qualified based on uh, his extensive experience in renovating golf courses with flooding problems. Uh, we also uh, asked them to provide us with a, uh, a bid. Now there's two parts to the bid. The first is the base fee, which is the master for the master plan. And then the second portion is a construction fee percentage based upon the overall project. Now the challenge that we have at hand is that without a master plan, without bids, we don't have an idea, or an accurate idea, how much it's gonna cost, but we have a pretty good idea that it'll probably be in the million and a half range. So we took the percentages that they provided us and applied it to that uh, million and a half. If you turn to page three, uh, you'll see what we did was we lined out each of those, uh, and you'll see that Colligan at $45,000 for the uh, master plan, 7% on the construction, which turns out to be $105,000, 105, the total cost is $150,000. Uh, George came in at total cost of 148, uh, and Staples had the lowest base fee, but the highest construction fee, and he came out at 178,200. Uh, at this time, we're looking at only receiving approval for the uh, the master plan only. But I wanted to we wanted to present to you the base fee and the construction fee because you can't have one and ignore the other. Uh, and so if you wanted to go for the uh, least expensive, uh, that would be Staples at 28,000, but once you get to, to the construction portion, they're the most expensive. Uh, and you can't mix and match, I mean, that just doesn't work. Um, so what we're uh, asking the board to, to do, not today, but this would uh, be uh, next week, is to approve uh, $43,000 for the selection of George Golf design. Uh, now keep in mind that we had in our capital budget $31,800, which had been allocated for the development of a master plan at Highlands Golf Course, and that project was canceled. So uh, what we're doing is applying that $31,800 uh, to this so that so that the uh, delta on the uh, capital plan is 11,200. 
what was the uh, uh, the Highlands plan? What was the well, the, the plan was to have uh, an architect come out and develop a master plan, a long range. When you're talking about a, long, a master plan, you're looking at a long range. What, what do we want to do with this golf course over the next several years uh, to make sure that it stays current and relevant and so forth? So that was the original thought, was to do that for Highlands. Um, uh, but uh, things changed during the year. And uh, with the flooding that occurred, uh, and the challenges that we've had and getting the results of the flood study and so forth, we decided to pivot and to change and to go forward uh, towards using that funds towards the country level. Okay, is that is that still something that we need to do or we will need to do in the near future? I think our focus right now, we should, uh, with the flooding, we need to focus on the country club. I think at some point in the near future, and David can jump in and he can correct me, but at some point in the near future, we need to look at the, the highlands. Well, what we were really looking at trying to accomplish was uh, going through a process, looking at tees, greens, bunkers, fairways. Uh, most of our golf courses, the tees aren't sized properly for the amount of people to play each side, each set. The very back tee should be small. The middle tees, where most people play, should be larger. And our, and our aging population, maybe the next team in front of that should be larger, too. And it's not always that way. And that was just Classic years ago, people built tees that were on the same size. But over the last 20 years, 25, we've evolved into knowing that from the very black tees, like at, uh, at Highlands, where we were both 16 last year, we made that a small team. Yeah. We made the next couple quite big. So that's some of the things we want to look at. Bunkers, making sure that our bunkers are maintainable, like we have done in the last couple of years. Rebuilding all the bunkers at all our golf courses so they're easier to maintain. Okay. Uh, Kind of club, we're even you know considering uh, changing out the fairway grass types because what we're going to have out there now is a, a Duke's mixture of 419, which is a hybrid Bermuda. We have a common Bermuda, we've got a little this, a little of that, and it makes for kind of weird playing stuff. So that's what the study would be. At Highlands, what we're actually looking at is maybe something that would be a, a long range master plan to take five years or six years to do. It. Country club is a little bit more urgent because of our flood situation. So we may have that happen in the next year or year. Nothing's going to happen. For all anybody that's listening, nothing's going to happen until at least 2021, I think, is our, you know, we're not going to close the golf course for a couple of years. Okay, I was just, I, 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 I agree that the urgency is with the country club. I just wanted to make sure that we were not foregoing doing something that needed to be done. Right, well, and, and we need to be cognizant. And, and you have a very valid point. Our goal this year was not to have a golf course closed. Uh, fortunately, uh, Mother Nature didn't cooperate with that goal. Uh, our goal for next year is, is to not have a golf course closed. One of the other things I'll, I'll throw in there is with, with our Adams Tour event in Highlands, we get a lot of exposure there. And we'd like that golf course at some point in, this, in the near future to start getting some upgrades. You know, we had some back keys a few years ago, uh, which got our distance up there so that we can host these young guys that did it so far. Um, for those of you that pay attention to golf, you're going to hear something very soon from the USGA and the RNA about trying to do something about that. This just came out in the last 48 hours. Uh, so there will be a news release on that, trying to figure out how to, how to combat people hitting at 360 yards every time Mike Brooks Kepka did this last weekend. <laughs> uh, but there are, there are two golf courses that really are you want to call them our flagship golf course or highlands because they have not in the country club because of this right here. We want to focus there. I can't stress enough uh, my hope that we approve this because, uh, and uh, obviously this group uh, appreciated uh, George Golf Design the most. Geographically, he's from the east, Colligan's from Texas, and Staples from Arizona, and they all have long time experience as good designers they have very some have good experience in dealing with flood situations george was superior in that respect he showed us example after example after example of how he remedies serious flood situations at other golf courses and uh, this is important that we act now in my opinion and it, it'll be a 90-day study 
So end of November, the master plan will be done, but it'll be done, it'll be done in concert with the hydrology experts. So if in, in some point the greens are moved, the teas are moved, or raised or moved out of this floodplain, and certain other remedial effects are proposed, then the hydrology and civil engineers can proceed to getting permits to uh, remedy the situation, not completely, but somewhat from the floods, uh, and hopefully get permits to the core and FEMA going right after this study is, is done. And that those permits are going to take a long time, too. But at least we're hoping to beat the flood with this proposal. So uh, as, as you describe it, um, obviously, we, we can't we can't completely uh, exactly forecast the the time that's going to be necessary for them to execute uh, the plan. Okay, but if the if the licensing process begins in November. And I have heard horror stories, I think, from other people from the board and other projects that we have been, been considering, that this can take months to get everything lined up. We are looking at a golf, the country club being closed next summer. No, no, no. 20. 20. Maybe in 2020. Oh, potentially 20. 20. Probably not 19. Mostly in the winter. Okay, okay. So we are. Okay, so it's not a matter of executing the, the, the task immediately upon gain, uh, gaining the... So we have to have the mass plan complete, and then we can go to the core and all the other governmental right. and entities. We can't go in half. We have to have the completed before we can go. The challenge is, it, it prefer, the quicker we get to the, to the, to the line, the better. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm still not understanding. I, I guess I'm a little bit thick. Uh, so we we get the we begin the process of getting the the uh, permits. The permits in November. That yeah, right? actually, that'll be done during this time period with the hydrology consultant because they'll work together on defining what. Greens may be raised without going through a huge long permitting okay. process. Which ones we better leave where they are? Which ones can be moved? And uh, because our hydrology engineer has terrific history with the local district of the Corps of Engineers. So we're start talking about starting the project in the uh, October November time frame of 2018. I mean, the Task. Well, we won't. We won't. We don't have the money now to do the construction parts. But at least when we do get a flood or when we want to fix things, at least we know what we want to change. Okay. And let me throw something in there. Uh, even if we started the permit process immediately, uh, we can't because we don't have enough information. But if we started the, the least amount of time that we could spend is more likely a year. Uh -huh. And some of them depend upon what we actually do around the golf course would take 18 months. Okay. Uh, and depending upon the scope of work that we do, we would actually probably have to start construction in March or April of a year. Because if we change areas that are Bermuda grass, which is warm season grasses, we have to have that planted yeah. by July. And our cool season grasses, like greens, if we wanted to redo greens, we can't plant those till September. So the golf course would be closed for a full year when we yeah. do this. And we don't want to really piecemeal it. There may be some areas out there where we can uh, repair some of the stream banks, according to Ryan Castor and Bernstein, and also um, study that won't impact what we're going to do on the golf course. Right. So some of those things, when we decide we have the money, we can put forward that, but we still have to go through the permit process. But when we determine those areas, don't affect yeah, I, I just so what you what you really done is set a set a time frame where I can understand when country clubs are going to be out of commission. You know, and that's what I was sort of struggling to. However, all this is contingent upon having the money to do it. I understand what we feel is necessary to do. I understand. How much does the uh, uh, 
the lead time in getting contractors lined up to do this work? How difficult is that? For the golf course side, that would take uh, 30 days from the time we were ready to go to bid with the documents and had permits in place. Uh, generally, I would always give the uh, contractors 30 days, we'd have them, would send out a notice to bid, and we'd ask them to come in for a site visit, and we'd generally give them a couple of weeks. Uh, there's no point in giving golf course, and they're hungry these days. There's no work out there. I wouldn't give them more than, than, than from the time I had my pre bid meeting until the bids are due, I give two weeks. So the bureaucracy and the red tape is the that's, that's the time frame. That's what takes the time. And the money. Okay. Any other questions? If not, that will be brought to a vote next Thursday. Okay, now it's time for an open forum. Yes, Linda. I wanted to thank the board very much for their consideration of the new community center. It's incredibly important. We talk about marketing that we bring Battle Vista both literally and figuratively out of the 1970s and into at least the current decade or something that starts with a two. <laughs> that would be great. And as far as the real estate market, a real estate market is considered at equilibrium when you've got a six month supply of listings. For the last almost two years, we've been running below a three month supply and often below a two-month supply. So our issue for real estate people in Bella Vista is not demand, it's supply. I spent the last six weeks working with some $400,000 cash buyers from New Hampshire, as an example. Last week, in desperation, they went to Kansas City and bought a house. So the problem is not people coming into town the, the problem is there's just not enough supply. So not that we should stop marketing, but it's, it's tough. And it's especially tough for younger people because where the supply is most lacking is first time home buyers, people without a lot of down payment because they're competing against people who are downsizing and are cash buyers. And if they're not cash buyers, I've had people that are making six and seven offers on different houses and they're getting beat out. So we have a serious supply issue. So thank you. Thank you. Morning everybody. Morning. I, I concur with what Linda said. I support the uh, community center. Uh, however, I want to go back to the survey for a moment of question five. Having designed surveys and done uh, quite a bit of statistical analysis, I know that survey questions are very important. How do you design that survey question? In this particular question, you have 700 people. That's nearly a third of the responding responders uh, didn't answer. So I would caution you about drawing any conclusions about that 62-37 split on, on the uh, responses. Uh, and I would, somebody suggested that perhaps they didn't have enough information, and I agree with that. I think probably cost is what they didn't have. You didn't ask them if they were willing to spend $5 a month more or $10 a month more to have a community center. So a better design of that question would be, how much are you willing to spend to get this community center? And, and unfortunately, my anecdotal evidence what I'm hearing from friends and neighbors and what I'm reading in the paper indicates that you know your probability of getting a community center, getting an assessment increase to pay for this is pretty close to zero right now. And having worked on a lot of committees to try to get assessments passed in, uh, in my past year, uh, it's going to be tough. You guys going to have a lot of work to do to convince folks, especially the non-resident property owners, who will probably never lay eyes on a community center. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Other comments? Before we make announcements, I have one uh, item I'd like to bring up, and I'd like to tell you up front that I had it. Uh, we started at 8 o'clock with a work session. What are the possibilities of moving that to 9 o'clock instead of 8 o'clock for the general public? and? And yes. people who come in, yes, sir. Yes, like ten yeses. Working, do you have a problem with that? 
Does I, anybody have a problem with moving it to 9 o'clock versus 8 o'clock? I know it's something we've always done, but it's time to maybe, John. It went to 9 o'clock to 8 o'clock. The purpose was to allow people to come to the meeting before they went to work. And you can see that it was not a very effective decision. So coming at 9 o'clock, maybe we'll get some people that wake up a little later and decide to come at 9 o'clock instead of 8 o'clock or have had their coffee and decide to just come out, whatever it takes. But do we have any objections? We don't need a motion other than that, that if we have approval of everybody sitting here, and I trust that Bruce is up in the morning early, so he could probably make it at 9 o'clock as well. So, Okay, so as of September, Work session, we will be at 9 o'clock. Pat, put down 9 o'clock. Okay? Okay. Any other comments? Thank you. Well, he had a problem before with the evening one. Uh, <laughs> yes? Yeah. Uh, what do you think we can do to get out the word that the, uh, the little rental structure that was off the Kingsland? Are not PLA. I'm still seeing that we're being accused of putting up things just for the bikers to rent. Doesn't didn't there a sign that says Cooper? I don't know if there's a sign. Oh. There's not a sign yet. Not a sign yet. Okay. We're saying that on <laughs> so so that would it would bother me if we had the rental, you know, controlling the rental of that property. But we didn't put them up. Somebody spread misinformation around the community to say that we're spending money building these things and you know, I don't know how you combat that when people want to spread bodies. Unfortunately there's so many words. <laughs> yeah. Good. Tim, go ahead. I was looking at that this weekend. There is a sign there um, that I don't remember exactly what it says, but it's clearly not POA. And I believe it does say Cooper on it. And they are the correct size, so there's not a problem there. Yeah. They're 1100 or 1050 or something. 1086. 1386. 1386, so it's not a problem there. So, so uh, excuse me, we had talked, uh, and I, thought, I think Jim made an excellent comment about uh, how receptive John Cooper would be in terms of easements and stuff like that, getting water into the, the Arco area. Uh, could we make that as a formal request of you, Tom? I already have it down. I'll take care of it. Okay. I think, yeah, at the end, uh, it's not real estate. It's uh, community recreational growth. And the property exactly suits itself for that. And secondly, part of the central trail is going to go through Cooper property anyway, right, right just to the southwest of that. And uh, apparently Cooper has approved with Aaron rushing that they can do that, so. We know we're looking at a significant timeline before these trails are open, so it's not something that has to happen today. Right. I mean, we can look at this and potentially other areas where we might expand or be able to expand camping opportunities in the future. Yeah, Aaron was saying it was a two-year bill. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, I mean, it's that's not something that we have to do today. No. But, agreed. But at the same time, too, uh, you might uh, run that by Joan and see if she said she thinks that that's something that to be a market, market for. Agreed. Anything else would go to the cost? If not, Board Record Board meeting will be Thursday of next week, the 23rd, at 6.30 p.m. Here at 6.30 until the 6th. Uh, just one comment, Ruth. I know we're starting to get back. I've got to glamour. Um, I want to commend uh, especially Tom and Ruth for starting the process of getting committees more active, getting committees more active and involved earlier than in the past couple of board groups that I've met.